Good afternoon and welcome to this Saturday at the Edinburgh International Book Festival. My name's Nick Barley, I'm the director of the festival, and it's my great pleasure and honour to welcome you to this special keynote event at the festival. Back in 1990, when the Berlin Wall fell and there were celebrations around the world, it felt, I think, that democracy was on the rise, democracy was on the march, and it seemed as though freedom of speech was about to take over across the world. And look at where we've got to today, when all around us walls are being built and faith in democracy seems to be plummeting. This was the situation which I put to Yanis Varoufakis when I invited him to be a guest selector at this year's festival. And I was so proud that he agreed to take up the challenge and ask whether globalization is killing democracy. His hope is that together we can find ways that democracy doesn't die. He's part of a new political party called DM25, which he'll talk about today. But the first of his five series of discussions is with Pussy Riot's Masha Aliokhina, who has gone through so much in the name of the right to speak out. This is a special event, and I really want you to show how much it matters to Edinburgh and to the world. So please put your hands together and give the biggest round of applause for Masha Aliokhina and Yanis Varoufakis. Well, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Edinburgh. Thank you all for being here. This is not about me. This is about Masha, Michael Kima, a force of nature, a force of <laughs> libertarian, democratic, musical energy. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to be here sharing a stage with her. Um, I think we should begin with a story. Let's sit down. Yeah. Let's be of how you got to be here, because um, um, you're coming straight out of Zone Russia, as you put it in your book, and in a particular way that, you know, usually people come to Edinburgh uh, to make a point. Uh, I think that Masha made the point e even before she came to Edinburgh <laughs> in the manner in which she reached this fine city. So, Masha, how did you get here? On Magic Pony. So the, um, shortly, I'm not um, like officially. I'm not allowed to leave Russia, so I cannot, you know, take an airplane or train or something. Um, and this uh, ban uh, happened after. Uh, so in April, we made an action in the front of FSB service, which is former KGB, uh, Russian. Uh, uh, security service. So uh, we were throwing uh, colorful paper plants to the wall uh, of FSB, main building. And that was a protest against... Uh, so FSB decided to uh, crush the only free messenger in, in Russia, Telegram, because the head of this uh, messenger refused to give FSB uh, an option to read all our messages. So he is quite a brave guy. Uh, after that, FSB decided to just to destroy, to, to ban this messenger. And um, paper plan is a symbol of this messenger. So uh, we, uh, about maybe 100 people, uh, not so much, came to uh, to the building of FSB with colorful pa paper plants. In half an hour they arrest us, uh, 48 hours uh, in the cage in the police station. We spent 12 people. And uh, after that, that was a court uh, who gave me uh, 100 hours of uh, community service works, which I refused to do because I, I believe that our actions are better than you know community service works. You uh, had already... <laughs> Done the community service. Yeah, that's a what major I said to them. By protesting it, against the FSB. Yeah, so 
um, they uh, made a decision to like punish me because I I did not uh, do their community service. So now I'm not allowed to leave the country. I cannot, you know, go to the airport. And I was quite surprised when I knew it. But I mean, it happens. It, Russia is interesting, unpredictable country. You don't know what will happen tomorrow. And um, yeah. And in December, uh, we've been uh, with Pussy Riot also in the front of FSB uh, with, you know, I don't know how much do you know about uh, FSB, but it's actually one of the, you know, ruling parties in Russia. What so do you mean? I thought it was the state of Russia. Yes, this is, this is. So Putin used to be a KGB agent uh, on 70s working in Germany. And we all know there is no ex-KGB people. So now FSB... <laughs> like, you know, there's no such thing as an ex-Goldman Sachs person. <laughs> yeah, so in, we have on 20, 20th of December the official celebration of uh, Cheka. It's, uh, yeah. you know Cheka. Of course. So it's like... It looks like, like an old Orwell's book, but in the main Russian channel, uh, Channel One, we have a huge concert in the biggest concert hall in Moscow. Uh, celebration like 1937, 2017. So these people are proud of what, what happened in 1937 when almost all the Russian culture was crushed. All my favorite poets, theater directors, uh, writers, they all were killed mm. in concentration camps during the 30s. So, and now we have, in 21st century, official celebration of Cheka, of the organ who, who actually killed all these people. So we, 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 front, uh, we came to the front of uh, FSB with a huge banner, Happy Birthday Executors. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that's why I was uh, <laughs> telling you this story. Um, and uh, the, after that, I also received this like, community service. Um, so, and I've seen, after that, they arrested me, and I've seen Lubyanka inside. That was the first time. I've never, it's, well, it's quite an unusual place. Yeah. So, and you ended up driving all the way uh, mm. through Belarus in order to get Ponya. to Lithuania or something? Or something. Yeah, or something. <laughs> yes, yes. You see, look, I mean, most of those of us who pretend to be radicals, uh, you know, we are armchair revolutionaries, really. I mean, we sit and we write, and uh, some of us even have uh, fights with the European Union establishment. But in the end, we are more or less certain that we are going to go home to our beloved um, at night. But uh, this person here doesn't know what's going to happen to her when she goes back home. Yeah, I don't know. And I think that <laughs> really should humble the rest of us, the pseudo-radicals. There is something qu quite interesting. I mean, this book, by the way, is, um, is a knockout. It's, uh, you, you start reading the first page, you don't put it down until you end, and then you want to read it again. Um, it's, 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 it's a poem in 199 pages or something. Uh, and so, read it. But for a number of reasons. Firstly, because it's a fantastic book, but secondly, because I think that w w with regard to, to Russia, it brings out a sense of crushing continuity. On the one hand, you have you know, um, Putin, who is this figure that creates or tries to create, uh, to, to draw a line of continuity from the Tsar to Stalin to himself. Yeah. Right? You're right. Somebody who revived the, the communist national anthem, 
uh, who revives the spirit of the Soviet Union while at the same time being in, in cahoots with the Orthodox Church to restore a kind of czarist, um, extreme right-wing uh, mentality. And then you have somebody like Russia. Uh, I was really moved when, in your book, uh, you described the, f the first time somebody said, congratulated you for what you were doing. When you met a dissident who had been in a Soviet labor camp, who said to you, you should be proud of what you did. And that continuity that you're creating is a, a, a fantastic opposition to the continuity that Putin is trying to create. Uh, and so tell me a bit more about the, the way in which you, know, you connected, I don't, I don't think that you, you were intending to do it, it just happened, with a long line of dissidents who challenged authoritarianism in your country. Well, um, this uh, person whom you're talking about, Alexander Podrabinik, uh, he's my good friend, we became friends after, after this. And uh, so he spent uh, five years uh, in the concentration camp in Gulag uh, on 70s. So, and he, they, they put him there because he wrote a book about how uh, how the heads of uh, Soviet Union used uh, psychological clinics for, uh, like, like prisons. We had uh, in Soviet Union uh, not only, you know, classical gulag, but also a psychiatric, psychiatrical clinics. Psychiatric clinics. The, the gulag Sorry. of psychiatric clinics. Yes, and he wrote about this a book. So after that, he'd been arrested and sent for five years. Uh, to Gulag. Uh, so, the tradition of dissidents, there is no kind of, you know, tradition. But it's, um, it started, I think, in the 60s, somehow, when small groups of people s start to actually come together to, you know, kitchen that was already, you know, a protest, because in Soviet Union, people were not allowed to criticize the state, even in the kitchen. So they printed books by, by themselves. They gave th these books to people. In um, 1968, when uh, Soviet Union tanks went to Czechoslovakia, eight people went just imagine huge Moscow and eight people went to the Red Square with, with a banner for freedom, yours and mine. And after that, all of them been arrested, sent for several years to different prisons. And one woman, Natalia Grbanevska, she was sent to a psychiatric clinic. She, by the way, Unfortunately, she, she died uh, two years ago, but she's, I, I knew her. She, she was an amazing person. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's how it's, uh, that's how it was that time. But now, um, now there is, of course, a difference. So how, how it works now in, in Russia? I don't know, I, I've never lived on 70s, but I, I can you tell w how it's uh, working now. For example, uh, you're writing a Facebook post, you know, uh, everybody's doing it, uh, with, you know, uh, some funny memes uh, about uh, Russian Putin's state. Uh, and uh, after some time, they can open a criminal case against you, uh, and you can go to prison. So now what happens with me, and with Pussy Riot, what was described in this book, and what was a quite unusual and scandal six years ago, now it became an everyday reality in Russia. And you even do not need to write a song and perform it. You, you can be arrested for, for like nothing. 
And uh, I want to mention one one man. He's a hero for my opinion. His name was Oleg Sinsov. He's Ukrainian filmmaker. He was arrested during the annexation of Crimea in 2014. He was sent to Russian prison to the hardest region for 20 years. So now during the World Cup, he announced a hunger strike. And he's on hunger strike now for 93 days. So he can die any moment. And well, he's an artist. And uh, I'm sure you should know his name because he's, for my opinion, he's one of the bravest people I ever knew. <laughs> well, this is. Mm -hmm. In a sense, this book is not about a story that ended mm -hmm. being told after a happy ending. Uh, this is a, a report from the Gulag. It's a report from uh, the battlefield for democracy, for uh, liberty. Uh, it's, it's a war that has not been won. It is a war that we, we may lose. There is no guarantee. I mean, Nick, in his introduction, talked about democracy and uh, how after 1991 and the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was this expectation of uh, a democratic transition in the East um, and a merger between our democracies on both sides of, the, of what used to be the Iron Curtain. But uh, we have to keep reminding ourselves that democracy is the most fragile of flowers and it is being crushed uh, almost everywhere. Um, in my own country, we don't have a democracy at the moment. We have the semblance of an electoral process uh, which is used to legitimize the fact that the demos has been taken out of democracy some time ago. Uh, and whenever it uh, threatens to reassert itself and reinsert itself into our democracies, it gets crushed again and again. Uh, but of course, it's done in a much more efficient way than in Russia. Uh, they don't need to use torture and, and prisons in the West anymore. Uh, but I, I wanted to, to concentrate on the word brave that you used to describe your friend, because it's also a word that applies to you. You wouldn't say it, but we have to acknowledge it. Uh, reading through th these pages, uh, the reader gets the sensation of a person that constantly fought against the specter of fear because not fighting against fear, not fighting against the prison guard who is uh, demanding that you say that you sign on the dotted line and you acknowledge what they say is the only way of maintaining your agency, maintaining your personhood. And in the end, you were rewarded uh, in rare moments in your cells, in your cell, in your... In um, isolation sometimes, um, by the sense that inside those walls you were freer than you would have been outside had you simply gone along with the lies and the facade. Were there many moments when you felt truly free or freer inside those walls? Uh, or were there few moments that were nevertheless enough to make you feel that it was all worth it? I think freedom is not about uh, being inside prison or outside of prison. Freedom is not about prison at all. It's uh, your own feeling of fighting for yourself. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter in which conditions you are, I believe. Inside prison walls or, I don't know, in British school. <laughs> <laughs> you mean a, a public school, as they would say here, you know, Eton or something like that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, firstly, I, I, I wrote a book because I, I believe that this story should be told and heard. But, um, you know, when you're, when you're writing about, uh, uh, how you said, postmodern gulag, uh, 
you, well, I didn't want to write uh, something like Solzhenitsyn wrote mm -hmm. because uh, it's not, not so many people can read it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's quite... So I just choose uh, situations, like a lot of situations. When I, when I made the choice, during uh, the period from the first action to the last day of prison. And I believe that in each life, in each fate, so everybody has this choice. It's just different for everybody, but it's, well, it's often not easier. So, and the choice is usually to, to stay aside from what is going on, or to do something. And this is for doing. It's a very practical guide for doing. <laughs> it is a manual, a poem, <laughs> and an impressionistic text of the highest order. Uh, but through this impressionistic, energetic, activist text of yours, uh, we get, as readers, a very concrete reality that hits us. And one of the interesting um, snippets that I got out of it, uh, this morning actually I was thinking about this, uh, Masha in her book describes the difference between the so-called political, politicals, that is prisoners who were in prison, mm -hmm. clearly for political offenses, like she was even though the state does not recognize that they were political prisoners. Well, the Maze prison in Northern Ireland was, was an, an example nearer to us. Recall Mrs. Thatcher denying that uh, the hunger strikers there were political prisoners, but nevertheless, everybody treated them as political prisoners. So similar with you. But the, the, the feeling I get is that the, the criminals and the politicals, even though they there was a difference, and you were being treated differently, and you recognized one another as a different category. Uh, nevertheless, and tell me if I'm wrong, it reminded me of another real and at the same time fake opposition between refugees and migrants. You know, this debate now about, oh, we should welcome refugees, but we should not welcome migrants. But in the end, they are the, exactly the same category of humanity. There are people that are running away from awful circumstances in their ha countries. And yet there is this hierarchy. A refugee is supposed to be more worthy than, 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 than a migrant, an economic migrant. And in your uh, gulag, in your uh, colony, as you call it in the mm -hmm. book, uh, the, there was this differentiation between political and criminal prisoners, but in the end, those women <laughs> where they're victims of uh, an authoritarian, sexist, patriarchal um, society. I mean, you, you describe some of the women that were there because they killed partners that beat them, raped them, um, abused them. And it, this, the sensation I get as a reader is that you were different and, 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 and similar. What, what is the question about... <laughs> To what extent was this difference um, able to keep you separate, to keep you apart from your cellmates who were in there for murder, for drugs, for I did not uh, keep myself. Uh, I did not, you know, uh, I did not keep myself away from them. I'm very, you know, I, I like to, to talk with people. I like people, and uh, I was really. Uh, it was very interesting for me to, to talk with anyone. The problem was in first colony, uh, they put me to solitary confinement and uh, people who tried uh, to talk uh, with me uh, in the so-called work, uh, they invited them to their special room and said that if you will talk with Marsha, you will get more three years in prison for disorganization of the order. This is a problem, I mean, uh, I, so, in, you should know uh, a little bit more about, uh, let's say, Russian women's prisons. So, 
why it is Gulag? Because we have not prisons. So we, we do not have, you know, classical prisons. We have colonies, like strange villages, um, where all the people, all the prisoners sh should work. They work 12 hours per day, minimum, six days a week, and they have about two or three dollars per month as a salary. So it's uh, legal slavery, as you understand. And this work is a sewing, a uniform for Russian police and Russian army and Russian prison guards. <laughs> yeah, so quite them. cynical, uh, I agree. But this rule of, uh, of labor uh, goes from the Soviet Union. If you will open the code, uh, like the book with the code, um, rules, official rules, law uh, of, of Soviet Union and Russia, it's totally the same. It's just uh, they called Soviet Union before and now they call it like Russian Federation, but words are totally similar. Um, and women who, whom you mentioned, who it's about maybe 35, 40 percentage of all the population, it's uh, Crimes connected with the domestic violence somehow, because in Russia we do not have any, you know, social mechanism for for people who who had domestic violence. So it's decriminalized now. And uh, for example, if something like this happening, woman can call the police, but police will come and take this man for eight hours and that's it. They will free him and he will come back. They have usually one house. And uh, beat them up even more yeah, severely. Yeah, again, again and again and uh, no social, let's say, how, I, don't, I don't know the English word. Um, Social no support, social support mechanism. For, yeah, for, no psychologists, no women. social workers. This all is doesn't work in Russia. Um, it just doesn't exist, actually. Um, so that's why these women usually uh, kill this man. And uh, I've heard a lot of stories like this. Or second. Uh, Second, like big part of the population is um, so-called drug crimes, but it's usually, uh, you know, it's not like selling of kilograms of heroin. You can go, I don't know, you can go to prison for se several years for like, for something which, uh, it's, when you start to describe, you know, Russian reality, you, <laughs> you understand that uh, you should, uh, it's like, you know, a guide for absurd reality where you somehow should explain to people why they can go to prison for nothing. Uh, <laughs> and it's quite hard. Um, but it's it, not just Russian reality, because I, I, you just reminded me now of my mother, who was a feminist in the 1970s. Well, and she was going Greece. around rural Greece with other women in buses that were usually stoned by local men uh, with one aim, to tell women in the countryside that being beaten up by their husbands and being raped by their husbands was not okay. Because, you know, if you, if you don't even succeed in, in doing that, then there's... A it's cool initiative, buses so with, like, the, loud... That, the 1970s in Greece. Wow. It's, it's, it's not that that long ago. So Russia is not that special a case, you know. Um, it's a good uh, idea, but bus. <laughs> 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 but speaking of <laughs> patriarchy, because this is what we're talking about, brutal patriarchy. Uh, the, in your book, there is uh, this uh, fascinating moment when you describe 
the ma- your guards were mostly women. Yes. Yeah. How, however, the commanders, the lieutenants uh, above them, treated them more or less like property as well. And there is this wonderful, almost Hegelian moment in the book when Masha is describing her prison guards, women prison guards, as prisoners because they wore a uniform, they wore ugly shoes, and they were on one side of barbed wire. No, not the same side. But they were walking up and down next to barbed wire. And the men running the prison system treated them like property. So, if you... Yeah, I, uh, it's, well, it maybe sounds strange, but it's awful work. I mean, they have almost no money and almost no, cho- no choice to have another work, usually. Because, you know, there, there are so many like, s- small towns where there is no workplaces at all besides, you know, to work there. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, for example, somebody of them is not agree with the system, what is going on, that will be a hell for them. Mm -hmm. So they do not have workers' unions. It's not allowed in Russia. It sounds like a paradox, (laughs) Uh, but yes. And uh, for example, if they do, don't want to, I don't know, obey this uh, system which is like totally unhuman, they will be just fired. Firstly, they will take off some of the stars, and second, they will, f- they will be fired. Yeah. So sympathy for your prison guards um, is uh, perhaps the most potent weapon you have against the prison system. I just understand. I was talking with them. I mean, I just understood that uh, it's not, you know... Usually, uh, they... they just afraid to change something because all their life were, you know, against these changes. And it's, it's quite a sad story. Um, Well, I just, I don't know what, what, to, uh, what to add because, you know, understanding uh, of their human beings, it's uh, one side, but uh, on the second side, you understand that if that will be in, you know, order to punish you, to put you to, I don't know, solitary confinement, they will just obey and put you. So you should fight with with them with uh, with what you have with your brains <laughs> uh, because usually uh, you don't have anything else and you fought them you fought them while you were in those colonies you took them to court and you won cases against them mm-hmm. and in the end that improved massively the conditions of your fellow prisoners it's improved uh, Conditions and uh, some of these uh, people were fired after the after our court. So I went to the court against prison guards because, well, because that was unfair what they done. Um, they start to punish me as again and again and again, and uh, we together with my lawyer and uh, other activists who came to this uh, small city which is like in Ural Mountains. I don't know, do you know where is Ural Mountains? But it's fucking far from here. (laughs) So uh, we went to the court against them and after two months we won. And after that, uh, the calling started to change. Uh, Yeah. So they start to reconstruct barracks, put up salaries a little bit. They fired several prison guards who, who was against the law. And um, after that, um, 
they somehow pleased Moscow, and uh, that was a special paper about me written to put me out from this penal colony to another one. So I've seen two colonies. Um, yes. And in second penal colony, a quite similar story uh, happened. I have asked enough questions, and now it's your turn. We are going to take questions for the rest of the session, uh, three or four at a time. So, I believe there are some ro uh, roving and roaming microphones. Um, so, there is uh, the lady over there. We begin with you. One, uh, there is um, a hat being waved for effect. I should very also stand up. Uh, third, and can we have another woman? Another woman, please. Okay, I am four. So, begin. Hello. Um, I would like to know more about your childhood and if it had any influence on your activism now. Uh, let's, let's take all of them first. I should stand also. So you wait. Okay. You wait. Uh, what, okay can, let's can you repeat let's the move first? to the second question now. Who is the second one? Can you uh, stand up? Hello. Hi. Oh. Yeah. Welcome to Edinburgh. Uh, you're a great inspiration to us. Um, there were 27 deaths in uh, police custody in the UK in the last year. Um, so we are having some of the same problems with our police forces as you're having. There must be positives from your campaign and Pussy Riot's bravery in standing up to state oppression. What are some of those positives that we can learn from you? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next one. Uh, yours. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm, unfortunately, I can't stand up, so I'll um, <laughs> sit down. Um, I'm not too sure how the translation is going to work here. Uh, I'd just like to say that I'm, um, I'm in a mood. Okay, so let me explain. I read a few weeks, uh, a couple of weeks ago, that uh, Pussy Riot has an art exhibition uh, in Summer Hall. And it's not an art exhibition. It's no? a, a, yes, it's a, my book on the stage. It's a quite punk concert. It's not yeah, exhibition. Yeah, yeah. This, this is the point. It's a performance. Um, the point uh, that the concert is, I can't get access to it. I was so disappointed. So, given the fact that uh, um, you're, you're here in Scotland um, and you did a gig in Glasgow a year, maybe two years ago, have you plans maybe to go to Glasgow while you're here in Scotland to do another gig? That's my question. The question about Glasgow. Okay, and, okay. One, and l l the fourth question from the lady. Yes. I'm very interested to know uh, any possible effects on family that you may have back in Russia, uh, given that you've taken the steps that you have to be here, which I think is wonderful. But I'm concerned if you have family back there, what they may feel and may think and what may happen to them as a result of your actions. My family, okay. So, um, with what uh, question uh, with, we should start? I just, I mean, I forgot the first one. Um, sorry. Where is my son? That, that was a question. Yeah. Your childhood, about your childhood. Ah. My childhood? Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, I've changed uh, six schools. I was quite a problematic person. Um, so... Um, what? Um, I love the um, music. Um, totally different, I don't know, from Radiohead and Spice Girls to uh, bands whom you totally do not know because it's like Russian punk from 80s, like Grazdanska Barona, maybe you will hear, I don't know. They are quite cool. They are also from, you know, from the Urals, from almost Siberia. And uh, it's amazing poetry. So if I'm sure that was translated 
uh, Igor Letov, he's cool. Um, and uh, my last school was a quite, you know, wealthy place uh, where almost all the class knew what will happen with them next, what university they are going to, you know, go, and whom they are going to be. That was quite strange for so, me. So it's a bit like Eton knowing that it will go to Cambridge and then get uh, a position in the Tory government. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, but um, I went uh, by hitchhiking to the south of Russia and I was living in the tent almost all the summer uh, in, the, uh, in the beach uh, near the sea. Um, And, uh, well, it's okay, it's uh, not childhood already. Um, what's about childhood? Can I love to do uh, climbing uh, on the trees on the very All top. Right. <laughs> How? What effect did your childhood have on your activism? You were a very activist child from what? From yeah. kind of, yes. Just climbing but tall um, trees. It's a... <laughs> it's <laughs> a... Uh, I'm... I mean, I, I already have a child. And he's quite, you know, he's 11. So he's not a child anymore. Um, so it's... Um, Strange uh, question. I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure that I've grown up, actually. Has he rebelled? <laughs> <laughs> Has Philip uh, re rebelled against you? Oh, yeah. Mm. He, he is rebelling against mm -hmm. you. So that's your comeuppance. This is, uh, yeah. this is the price you have to pay. Now, what about the question that we had from the gentleman in the hat um, regarding the this similar or similarities with the prison system here and deaths in custody um, in a, a Western liberal democracy? I don't know uh, so much about uh, prisons in Great Britain. I met just one uh, organization who was working with uh, prisoners and who in London four years ago. Um, so I don't know so much about this, but well, I, I will be happy to know. What I was really, what is really strange for me that uh, so, I mean, um, one second. Um, I'm wondering why so many pages in the newspapers are dedicated to royal family. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, when my book was published, I spent uh, some weeks in London, and uh, it's really <laughs> like you open the newspaper and it's like about lentils uh, in the soup uh, of, of this boy. And it's strange, I mean, uh, if you can change this, it will be great, because... Uh, <laughs> but I think in Scotland, it's a pretty easy argument to make. <laughs> Though not necessarily in Edinburgh. Uh, let's have another round of questions. Uh, the gentleman here in front of me in the glasses, the lady behind him, since you're next door to one another, uh, another lady here, and the gentleman And th that was a question about Glasgow. Yeah. Well, keep... We've been in Glasgow, but one day, just one day in November last year. It's totally different from Edinburgh. And I hope, uh, I don't know, we will come back there or, or not, but uh, I mean, I really love Scotland and I, I want to see more cities, not only Edinburgh and Glasgow. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
The, the lady was wor wor worrying about your son and your beloved ones back in Russia, now that you're here. Are you worried that they, the regime are going to target them? That's more or less it, isn't it? Well, um, I think it's uh, the question not uh, only about my son, but about like family, because uh, yeah. I have mother and father and father of my child, with whom he is now. Um, well, I don't like all these ifs. What can happen with me if I will do this action, for example? If you will think like, like this, you will never do anything. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's take the other questions. It's thank, uh, thank you again for making the trip here, and uh, it sounds like the details should remain private. Um, and uh, I'm one of many who are inspired by your story and your, your activism. And you started to answer my question already, which is, do you get scared? And when you do, what do you do with your fear? Hold on to this thought. Are there any particularly good uh, interventions or tactics from Pussy Riot that you think we should use in the Scottish independence movement? Uh, what? Are there any of the actions that Pussy Riot uh, have utilised that they can use in the context of the Scottish independence movement? Are you familiar with the debate in Scotland as to whether they should be part of the U UK or not? Yeah, I... I uh, okay, so I've hold that. <laughs> because now I have another two. We have the gentleman. Um, hi there. I was wondering, uh, in terms of economic issues, um, if Pussy Riot have a particular like, economic perspective in terms of left-wing, right-wing, free market. And also, if you know Yanis's work, uh, what do you think about it? <laughs> that I will not allow as a question. It's not about me, it's about Masha. And lastly, the gentleman here. Oh, sorry. You'll come later. Yes. I really just wanted to press the question that remains. Okay, on. so maybe we can have this, uh, this question here. Does, uh, do you believe ridicule, detournement, will ultimately damage and bring down Putin's regime? Do you believe humor and ridicule? And detournement, ridicule. Uh, Pussy Riot use detournement. You know the French sense of that you would you would understand the word. Yeah. Um, Maybe I just don't know. The, young the women challenge Putin and his power. You don't do any damage. You're not terrorists, but he has to overreact to you with all the force of the state. So you basically ridicule him. Uh, you you make him look. Well, allow me to phrase it uh, using this. She says here on page four, we believe that if we pricked his ass with a pin, Putin would jump out of his presidential seat. <laughs> <laughs> it's, Masha will answer your question properly afterwards. Uh, okay, so, do you remember the questions? Well, uh, just say anything you want as in reaction to what yeah. you remember of the questions. I forgot them. Um, That's okay. You have, you have it in your mind. Do you in get your scared? Do you get scared? And what do you do about it? Oh my God, it's a yeah. question about fear. Uh, we are in the motherland of Harry Potter. You remember what, uh, what was about fears there? So you should just do not uh, allow them to grow. And if they will grow, I mean these fear monsters, you should just uh, make a fun of them. What? Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, I mean, fear usually, uh, I mean, it's quite useless thing. Uh, I don't, uh, I mean, we all have uh, totally different situations when we feel different feelings. It doesn't matter. Uh, what you do, this matters. You can feel, you know, un hundreds of different feelings. You should 
the importance is to do, to overcome yourself, this is uh, important, I think. And uh, I don't know. I, I've never, I've never uh, felt uh, this about me. And uh, if I felt uh, something about um, somebody else, I'm just trying to to do something for for this person. So that combines uh, this question with the last one about using ridicule in order to overcome what fear. Ridicule, ridicule is to, 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 to laugh at somebody, to laugh ah. at somebody, to, to make them look ridiculous, ah. to make them look stupid through humor and through satire. Uh -huh. Correct? And, and actions too. And performances. Yeah, I think, uh, well, I don't know why, but um, these people from Russian state, they somehow afraid of, uh, of fun. It's not just the Russian state. Let me tell you that in Brussels, in the European Union, I experienced exactly the same thing. <laughs> a complete aversion to humor, on the one hand, and the ironclad determination never to admit mistakes. Yeah, this is what happens with big bureaucracies. This is what come, happens with authoritarian regimes. They loathe humor and any sense of self-criticism. Now, what about Scottish independence? Do you have a view about, about this? Oh. <laughs> you can say no. <laughs> what, what do you think? I just... <laughs> okay, let's have a poll. Let's have a poll. If there were a referendum this afternoon, who would vote in favor of Scottish independence? Oh, uh -huh. And Okay, put your hands up. And who would vote in favor of staying together with Theresa May? Oh. <laughs> so you have half... <laughs> and Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> okay, so we have a clear majority in favor of Scottish independence. I think we have half and half. She's more of a diplomat than I am. <laughs> uh, and fine, uh, there was this question about, uh, does Pussy Riot have a political economic manifesto for Russia? Yeah, more or less? Do you have a view about the... I understand the question. ...how you should run the, yeah, the, the economy, which is, of course, where all power comes from? Well, what... This is... <clears throat> This question is, well, you just should know Russian reality because, well, to have free market or to have, you know, more social government, this is a question for the country which is not, you know, torturing people every day or killing oppositioners who just provide the independent position. Uh, and now we have, we have regions, some regions in our country where women, women are killed because, you know, because their husbands died, and women, for their opinion, should go to, to the grave with the husband, and she cannot leave if he die. And uh, they, I don't know, they beat women with the stones, and it's not, it's not a joke. It's not like, you know, a scene from the film. And uh, it's quite hard uh, for me to, you know, uh, to imagine how it should, it should be, because we had 100 years, almost 100 years of totalitarian regime of Soviet Union, and only 10 years in 90s, when I grown up, of, let's say, freedom and democracy. 
and after that, Putin became a president and started to reconstruct uh, this. I don't know how, how to. It's not a pure Soviet Union, but it's uh, it's almost. So. I don't know uh, how to. Maybe in future I. I can write this kind of manifesto, but when you see how how people are dying, you you think firstly about saving life. Mm. Mm. I would like to take one question, because we don't have much time left, from a young woman, just to honor... Yes, you. Who? One young woman to another. Stand up. <laughs> hi, Masha, and hi, Yanis. Um, I'd just like you to please describe when you decided to take action, the moments leading up to that, and also what you think it would take more and more Russians to take action and to actually start uh, a movement within Russia. What will it take Russian people to make a change? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think, um you, sh you should know that uh, the protests which are going, uh, going on now in different cities uh, of Russia, not only in Moscow, it's a teenager's protest. So there are students, uh, girls and boys from uh, last classes of school, and uh, mostly it's them who are protesting now. It started last year and now now also, for, for the free internet that was li last action, uh, 10,000 people on the street, and uh, if you will look to the photos, it's, it's teenagers. And uh, for, for me, one action. You mean uh, like a political, let's say, political gesture, because before the Pussy Riot, I was an ecological activist. And uh, I, I did not, you know, plan to be uh, any activist. I just uh, opened the uh, internet and read that uh, some assholes wanted to build a villa in my favorite forest. <laughs> <laughs> and I did not know anyone, you know, no Green, Greenpeace, no WWF, nobody, nobody. I was uh, a girl with a two years old son that that's almost all whom I knew. I just start to, oh my God, I, I start to do different things. Um, I went to different organizations. I start to collect signatures. I, I start to, you know, make a, a group of people who are not uh, indifferent about the situation. And uh, step by step, that became a huge movement, like 10,000 people around Russia in different cities who made uh, actions and we, we stopped it. But what, what I learned that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter uh, who you are, it's, uh, do it doesn't matter in from which country you are from. If you want to do something, just I mean, just do. And uh, yes, we are living in the country where you can, you can be jailed for this. Uh, but it's not, you know, it's not the end of the world. So it's not, uh, for me, it's not a reason to stop. And uh, I do not uh, count how many of us uh, thinking in this way. But uh, I'm happy that uh, 
during the last six years uh, after the action, I met so many people who became an activist because of our case, because they seen that it's uh, unfair, and they seen that it's uh, that they also can do something for support us. For example, editor of this book, Olga, she's my really good friend, and she's very young, like 23 years old, girl. So when, six, six years ago, she was a teenager, and uh, she's very naive. Uh, she decided that she want, you know, to... So she was a policeman, yeah. She was, uh, she thought that justice exists in the police, and she was working there for a year and a half. And after that, uh, she was totally disappointed about this system. She quit the police, she became an activist, and in a half of, in several months, she, she met me. And uh, after we, she, and she edited uh, this book. And after we started to do actions together, we came, like, 6,000 kilometers to Siberia uh, to support Oleg Sinsov, which I mentioned. In we uh, shut down a Trump Tower for half an hour. <laughs> we went to Crimea, uh, which is like a nightmare. Uh, so, and she, she was just, uh, I don't know, just a girl who decided to change something, you know? Well, in your book there is uh, this um, magnificent quotation in which uh, Masha says that, uh, well, you're actually quoting Subcommandante Marcus, and you're saying that uh, when one person dreams, it's just a dream. But when many people dream together, it's a reality. It's a reality. So thank you for making Create this reality. a reality. <laughs> thank you for dreaming along with Masha. And changing the world in a small but substantial way. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think the involvement of her talking about her experience with the Russian state and then her, particularly with her son, I thought was quite interesting. And her, obviously her story is about prison. Yeah, we're obviously both fascinated because we've both just bought the book. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to go home and read that right away. I think it's very important for Zoe to experience uh, the opportunity to meet people like, and hear people like Masha speak. I thought it was interesting that Masha didn't want to focus on the past. She wanted to focus on the present and what we can do now to change things. And she's very interested in drawing attention to cases like imprisoned filmmakers and writers who we can uh, help to get out of prison. I think it's important to have inspiring figures who remind you first how lucky you are and secondly that you're not as powerless as you think you might be and that there is always something that you can do however small. She is someone who, who's at the forefront of um, really important actions and activism um, in, in, a, in a very urgent moment. Um, so, uh, yeah, a, a really important voice um, to hear in this, in, you know, this, this year. I think it's important to, to provide a platform for voices like Masha's because these are the voices that we need to be hearing, not dusty old kind of blokes <laughs> who've, who've got it all. Like, she, she provides a perspective on um, on, on revolution, on change that needs to happen and we need to support her and we need to be inspired by her to make those changes here.